I'm very glad that Gordon introduced me as a former advertising executive. I find when people discover that I'm a former advertising executive, it builds a bond of trust between us very quickly. Actually, I have to say I spent 10 years in advertising. I absolutely loved it. I loved the people. I loved the pace. I loved the creativity. And the lunches were fantastic as well. And uh, now I work for a place called London Institute, as was said, which was founded by this man, Uncle John. Now, Gordon has set out, if you like, the scope of the challenge, the workplace challenge. It's my conviction that the church's failure to embrace the workplace challenge is a symptom of a much deeper problem that affects almost every area of the church's mission to the world. And I think that unless we address the deeper theological problem, neither workplace ministry nor the church's uh, mission will flourish as it might do. Simplistically put, I think there are probably two main strategies for reaching the world. One is this to recruit the people of God to use some of their leisure time to join the missionary initiatives of church-paid workers. Now, how many people would say that that's probably the model of mission you have in your country? Just put your hands up if that's basically the model of mission that you have in your country. Most people here. Okay, this, here's, the second, here's the second model. The second model is to equip the people of God for fruitful mission in all of their life. Now, the reality is that strategy number one is the strategy in most countries in the world, as we've just seen, that is dominant. And the result of that strategy is this, that the 98% of Christians who are not in church-paid work, they are, on the whole, not equipped or envisioned for mission except in the two to ten hours that they might spend in church-related activities every week. That is the reality. That is the implication of strategy number one. So the workplace agenda is not some little thing on the side. It goes right to the heart of the potential of the world evangelization movement. In other words, as you saw on the card, 98% of Christians have neither been envisioned nor equipped for mission in 95% of their waking lives. What a tragic waste of human potential. Manila was good news for workplace ministry. The 12th affirmation reads this way. We affirm, we affirm that God has committed to the whole church and every member of it the task of making Christ known throughout the world. We long to see all, it says, all lay and ordained persons mobilized and trained for the task. However, in church practice and in daily life, that affirmation has been primarily understood and pursued as training lay and ordained people for neighborhood witness and neighborhood evangelism. Similarly, we can affirm the, the 14th affirmation. We affirm that every congregation must turn itself outward to its local community in evangelistic witness and compassionate service. Yes and amen. But interestingly, it does not say we affirm that every congregation must turn itself outward to its members' communities and networks in evangelistic witness and compassionate service. In other words, when I was in advertising, I knew the first names of probably 150 people in an organization of, say, 750. And I knew the names of over 30 clients. But I probably knew the names of only two people in my apartment block. Now, what might happen if every congregation started to pray by name for the people its members already know in the networks and communi communities they're already in? In reality, for whatever reason, the basic psychological model we have of the church, sorry, is of this. The dots are in the corner, in the ghetto. And every now and then we scuttle out to do some mission and then we scuttle back in. But in reality, the people of God are, Monday through Saturday, out in the world, touching hundreds sometimes, some, for some people, thousands of people in any given week, taking traces of grace out there. The most effective action against poverty is the creation of decent jobs. But the poor do not just need jobs. 
They need a vision for their job when they get one that goes beyond provision. We all need an understanding of how our job might be an intrinsic component of God's mission in time and eternity. Indeed, uh, the manifesto is much stronger on what we are saved from than what we are saved for. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in my workplace as it is in heaven, in my sweatshop as it is in heaven, in my kitchen as it is in heaven, in my school as it is in heaven, and so on. Who, who's going to influence multinationals to maximize the good? Outsiders or insiders? So in some, there is much to affirm in the manifesto, but nothing really about that document, from my perspective, that grips the heart or captures the full-orbed richness of God's mission to renew the world through the high calling of our daily work. So perhaps there are some additions to be made to the manifesto there. But I think if we stop there, we might miss a bigger issue. The question is why, despite the enormous evangelistic opportunity and transformational opportunity the workplace presents, why on the whole has the church not envisioned her people for fruitful engagement? Why, despite the fact that the Bible is brimming with material on work, have so few churches found a way to teach, envision, and support their people for where they spend most of their time? Well, the reason, as you might expect, is theological. Our actions are always shaped by our ideas. And the reason is the sacred secular divide, the belief that some things are important to God, church, prayer meetings, evangelistic outreach, social action, but other things, work, college, school, sport, music, the arts, sleep, rest, they don't really matter to God. Now, examples abound in every aspect of church life. Who are our heroes here this week? We honor, celebrate, and tell stories about pastors, preachers, missionaries, in the narrow sense, worship leaders, and praise God, social activists. But we almost never tell stories about school kids, or cleaners, or bus drivers, or lawyers, or bankers, or politicians. And then we wonder why our institutions and businesses lack heart, or teaching a child mathematics. So we may know in our heads that the gospel embraces every area of life, but this is not the gospel that we have been teaching people to live or celebrating when they do. It is not the lived gospel. We are not making disciples for the places people find themselves in. There is a crisis in disciple-making which is leading to a crisis in evangelization. So we rejoice in the progress that the marketplace movement has made. But the reality is we have a systemic issue. The sacred secular divide, SSD, is a systemic issue. The soil is toxic. The good seed of the marketplace movement, the workplace movement, the people of God movement, is being planted in poor soil. So it will not matter how much we water that soil, how diligently we seek to nurture the seed, how we protect the plant from disease, the soil is deeply affected by the sacred secular divide. So the people of God will not, cannot yield their full potential. And it seems to me that neither the Manila Manifesto nor the Covenant have named this issue or dealt with it. So the key missiological challenge is not only that we have failed to regard work as significant. The key problem is that we have failed to regard the whole of life as significant. The key challenge is not that the local church has not discipled people for daily work. The key challenge for the local church is that on the whole they have not. We have not discipled one another for ordinary daily life. We have not given people a vision for the adventure that it is to go out in Jesus Christ, in the power of the Spirit, into the world day by day and participate with him. So the good news is not that Jesus came to redeem our leisure time, but that he came to redeem all of our time. The good news is not that Jesus said, come, take up your cross and follow me when you get home from work or school. The good news is that he calls us to follow him every nanosecond of the day. The good news is that God in Christ not only created all things, but seeks to reconcile 
all things to him. Now you all know this. Here is the bad news. Although the church has identified this problem in every generation of the last century, we have not yet found a way to put this whole life disciple-making gospel back where it belongs, at the heart of our thinking and praxis. And the result of that is to take us back to where we started. There are two strategies to reach the world. The first one is to recruit the people of God to use some of their leisure time to join the missionary initiatives of church-paid workers. And the second one is to equip the people of God for fruitful mission in all of their life. Strategy one is what we have. I plead with you that it will not be what the next generation will have as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank <laughs> you.